exposed image and then develop it up, uh, be water soluble. If, where, where the unexposed areas would wash away, the rest would be baked on enamel. As you see from the samples here, it's like a black enamel. So that's how they get it to the plate. So basically, use a photographic coating, it's totally been water, it's hardened, it's uh, developed up with water, it's then <coughs> run through some chemicals and then baked to an enamel. And that becomes a protective coating for the image, for when you etch the image. Um, that's, so then, then there was finishes. The finisher basically took that metal printing block, and you'll see a couple there, and mounted on a piece of wood, or it might be mounted <coughs> on a piece of stereo metal. And uh, that's uh, how, yeah, to printing heights, and that's how they would, uh, the finisher would do. So they do, the finishers would do proofing, they proof an image. Uh, I actually worked as a proofer in one place in Sydney once, and there's some proofs of colour proofing. Where you have a print for each each, each colour, and there's just all the bits of scrap metal around, so it was just to see if the colour was all right. So that was in the early days. That's how the trade was broken up into. In the beginning, my core trade goes right back to probably <coughs> hand engraved into wood, and the tools I used to use when I was etching is not much different to what they used then and the technique was used. They would carve, they would actually, an artist would draw an image on a piece of wood and the engraver would hand engrave that image, like the early wood cut style. He would cut that image out and then it goes on the printing press. I haven't got any of those. And I actually found it while I was recently Googled up, I found a place in England where I could actually buy a wood cut. Um, as I said, etching, as an engraver, I was actually we, a process engraver, we use acid, a nitric acid solution to uh, etch the image. And it's, it's done by running it through an acid bath, and uh, very just very quickly, I'll be going on to this, you run through an acid bath, as the acid eats into the image, it also undercuts the image. Now, when that happens, if you just left it in the bath, the image would eat down and it would undercut that image and eventually the enamel would come off and you'd end up with just some humps there. You'd lose your printable image. So how did they do it in the, in the right up until when I come into the trade? I think uh, I brought out machines to get around that, but how we used to do it, people have wondered what this is, a rolling pin. <laughs> this is a leather roller. Very hard surface. What, what they would do is, and I saw this done uh, because one of the uh, etchers there, he had to make some printing plates out of copper, and they're going to be used as badges, so we etched them. And because we didn't have a paddleless etching machine, um, he had to do it by the old traditional way. So we used this leather roller. What you did is you rolled ink on a glass slab, covered it in ink, and you would take the printing plate with the printed image on it. Now this was unetched, so it's just got an enamel image laying on that, so it's uh, you know, a fraction of a millimetre sitting above the surface. Okay. Once you put an etch on it, that would eat in. Before the acid started undercutting the image, you'd take it out, dry it up, you would then roll it with ink across the image, the face of the image, like that with ink. You'd put a resin on it, heat it up. What would happen is the resin would bake hard and mixed with the ink or pitch that was on there, it would run down the sides of that raised image. So that, that roll was that hard, you could literally roll it just across a printed image on a plate without picking up the bottom. But of course, if you etched it a bit, you'd pick up a little bit more depth. But you could, you could feel it there, but because that's such a hard surface with a light layer of ink, you could actually protect the size of the image. So what you do is you pick that up, dry it, put it back in the acid bath, eat it down a bit more. As soon as the acid started undercutting the image, you take it out dry, put another roll on it, bake it over the gas, back in the acid bath. And you actually stage it. It would be like little steps and stairs going down the side of the image. And once you got deep enough, you would then uh, clean all that pitch off, and then where you had uh, a line work or a cartoon or something like this where there's line work, you would use a routing machine and you would cut out uh, deep in the other bit so the, 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 the um, the ink when it rolled on or the paper wouldn't go down and pick up any, any of the base of the image. So you've got a raised image, so you had to get plenty of depth there. 
that's how, <coughs> and there were actually people just in, in finishing their work as routers, so they, they came an image. I didn't have a photograph of a routing machine, but it's basically a bench, had a rotary cutter with an arm, with a long handle on a slide, which you had a foot pedal, you could control the depth of it and slide it back and forth, and you had a handle on here. So you could actually guide this route with your two hands and feet for depth, and with that cut of it, you could go around. Now, someone, the ones I used to curse were uh, like graphs or things where there's a lot of tables, because <laughs> they used to have to deepen all those little between those black lines and the graph, so it wouldn't pick up the ink. And by hand. You can see on these here where it was routed out, and eventually the router you cut right down, cut the image out altogether. So you would actually deepen those wide areas of wide open space so that you wouldn't get any dirt ink pick, picking up in there. Okay, some of you might remember the cartoons that did that. Now, with the advent of technology, and I think um, when I come into the trade 40 year, years ago, 41 years ago, these, they had these new paddle stitching machines. A couple of different shapes, that was sort of basically what they were like. Now, the only photo I get was low resolution, it was off the web, so I couldn't get a real... What, how they essentially worked, you clip the plate on the lid, <coughs> close the lid, and the paddles inside it threw a solution of acid and water up, but it also had an emulsified oil in it. Now what this oil did, I don't know how they invented it, but if you ever tried to degrease uh, a path or something smooth, and you squirt it with a hose and the oil rings run off but they'll pick up on anything protruding, sitting up and they're very hard to get off. So the flat areas it comes off but it picks up on any raised bits around. Well, how paddle setting machines work, they had an emulsified oil in the solution and depending on the paddle speed and heat, you, the oil would go to one side, protect the side of the image and the acid would eat straight into the plate. So you can sort of see there on there you probably get quite a few millimetres depth, depending on how long you left it in there. And it would just eat, eat straight down in it and you would get, a, that's how you would get a raised image. <coughs> um, on some of these you see here, you don't, <coughs> you paint shellac on that, you know, because the more areas that there are etching away, you weaken the acid solution so it doesn't go as long, you know, so you've got to make up it here, so you just sort of keep up the image. And you cut that out later and mount it up on a plate. Now, <coughs> they were paddle etching machines. We etched on uh, some of the some of the things we've used was actually uh, to uh, zinc, uh, magnesium. There's a magnesium printing plate there. They used nitric acid. Copper plates um, used, uh, I think, it was chromic acid. No, it was. Uh, Yeah, it was a different asset for that, but you, you had to use plastic bars and, uh, and porcelain bars because there's no equipment that would eat into it. So copper used a different asset again, the same principles. Um, fish glue, was something comes in the trade, the trade names are these quirky things, no one knows what they mean. Fish glue was actually a light sensitive coating they used to use before uh, on, uh, to coat the plate, the zinc plate, and that would, when it dried, it was light sensitive. But it, it had a fish base or something, I don't know where the formula makeup of it, but it was called fish glue, but it never glued anything. <laughs> it was a light sensitive coating. I found this bottle in a store and they were <coughs> shutting down the department and throwing things out, and that's probably 60 to 80 years old. Didn't use it in my trade, but uh, still a bottle, it was made in Scotland. <laughs> fish glue. Um, oh, sorry. Burning in is when the exposed. Oh, sorry. I, I just wanted to know its real name. What what what's the real name of it? That's the real name. Is, that is fish glue. That's what's on the label. Yep. Oh, right. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> it's, it's fish glue. Yeah. <laughs> it's both uh, process photo engraving. I'm interested there. Yeah. yeah. Right. Photo engraving okay. glue for process work. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Um, Burning in, another trade term. Well, once you uh, expose an image on a plate, you have to take, take, change it to enamel. So I went into an oven, you did that with the gas yourself, we put in a burning in oven until it turned black, and then uh, come in dragon's blood. Basically, <laughs> it was a resin. And that was a resin when you did the old rock and roll, uh, hand etching.
dragon's blood is what you dusted the ink with when you inked up with this. And then you'd heat it up over a flame and it would become a protective coating for the next stage of acid etching. But, uh, yeah. uh, deep etch is uh, deep etching an image so it's deep. That's, that's a bit of line art that's been deep etched. So just that, that's all there is. That's solid <coughs> Stopping out a plate for etching is where you um, actually in um, uh, hard that etching, which I'll probably touch on later on, you can actually, when you make uh, images for print, I'll go and hold this up. Images with a screen over them, I won't, I'll do that later, actually, but uh, that's what's stopping out is, is holding some areas from etching while you etch the rest of it, and you can actually create tonal contrast <coughs> Um Photographs, we basically take a line image and make a metal printing block. That's, that's the core use of the trade. We use acid etch out a relief image, and the raised image is used as letterpress printing. Plastic plates replace metal on news presses. In uh, that ear there, that's the only sample I got was a foreign order, <laughs> which I've had in a plastic bag, I used to make stamps out of it in clay. But that was a light sensitive plastic on a metal plate. And uh, 1976, they went from metal plates to uh, plastic plates on the, using the same press, letter press. These they could just wrap around the cylinder. Whereas the early pages, you had a flat page with all the type and that on it. They'd make a mould of it out of cardboard. They'd bend that mould and to cast a curved printing plate off that. Now, that tray completely ceased to exist when this came out because they went from a negative, exposed onto a plastic plate. Where the plastic was exposed to light, it hardened, the rest washed away in water. There's your relief image. Etches were redundant. <laughs> Simple as that. Okay. Um, I think it was 1986, we went through offset printing plates, where offset, I don't know if you're familiar with offset, I'll, do, I'll touch on it very briefly. Offset printing is uh, printing off a flat, Plate. It's not a raised image. There's a sample of one there. That's an offset printing plate, so like a grained aluminium, which actually holds moistens, holds moisture, a film of moisture easily. What happens is um, it goes back to early lithographic printing. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Whereas a litho stone, you ever heard of lith old litho prints? Do they have a stone and the artwork, art posters, you get a crayon pencil and you draw on the litho stone and crayon pencil, you then wet the stone. This, the uh, pencil repels the water, so it's dry, so it, but the water remains on the stone and becomes moist. <coughs> then you roll ink over it, with the roller, the ink doesn't stick to water, but it sticks to where you've drawn. You then put your paper on it, put it on a press, Peel it off, hang it up to dry because it's a bit wet, but there's your image on the paper. Offset printing is uh, <coughs> they, uh, you, 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 they, they flood that with a, with a fluid like, like water, but not it's a chemical. It, uh, they roll ink on it, and then that rolls onto a blanket. The blanket picks up the ink, but not the water, and then that blanket drum prints onto the paper. So that's why it's offset, so it's sort of the offset. Process. So you don't go for directly from the plate to the paper. There's a rubber blanket in between. Okay, that's why they call it offset printing. And that's uh, 1986, that when the Newcastle Herald, and some of you, I believe, have been through the press room over Barrisville. That used to, that press, or the, the offset press, it used to be in the Herald in Newcastle, <coughs> but they div divvied the, the, that off. I could have nearly ended up out of Barrow. <laughs> Photo engraving half tone colour, which I nearly touched on. Images where you see a photograph, like that. Every printed image you see has to be broken up from a continuous tone into printable images, which is what they call a half tone, which is got a black dot is the ink, the white dot is the paper. And depending on the size of that tone, 
how we get it to that is done by projecting that grey through a screen, like a mesh, on the film, and that breaks it up into black and white. Okay? Using uh, all the orthographic film, which is a short tone run, so we don't use panchromatic film. Now, you can get all various sized dots and uh, shapes, screens, but that's basically what they are. You can have them have them square dots, but it's the same principle. So the percent size dot governs the tone. So a grey, a mid-grey is 50% in, 50% paper. Every printed image you see, even today, use that principle. Okay? For colour, what they do is one printing plate prints each colour, but they just offset it, they angle the screen a little bit so that it prints like a little rosette. If you ever put a magnifying glass on coloured images, you'll see a little rosette where one dots, these dots will fall beside the other. If they print directly one on top of the other, you'll get a, effect, a moray effect or a pattern, which is unacceptable. So, so colour screens are always angled. Um, when I come into the tray, the, 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 one of the cameras here, they just actually, the first cameras they had were like a gully camera. That's a photo of one I found. Uh, quite giant cameras, because this is the size sort of images you're looking at copy, okay? That's a, that's a piece of film. The, uh, <coughs> there's the lens, you can't quite see the lens. There's your copy board there. There's the camera, and inside the dark room there's a, ba a vacuum back where you put your film and expose it in the dark room. Okay? So usually the dark room is built around the back of the camera. Early <coughs> models of this, they weren't backing onto a dark room, they were freestanding. In fact, some of them looked like they were running on railway lines down there, they're about that size, and they had a light box on the back with a shutter. A bit like the old early cameras, you know, where they sort of had put a cape over you and that sort of thing. Well, these, these had a light box you hung off the back and opened the shutter, exposed the film, and the exposure, they actually ran around the front of the thing and took a lens cap off and timed it. And back on, <laughs> took the box up into the dark room and developed it up. Now, from that, they developed more electronic and automatic things. Uh, the lighting used to be uh, Xeon, like uh, arc lamps. We used to have a big arc, like a big welding rod, that carbon rods that go around arc lamps. And, uh, I went to uh, different sorts later. Uh, early years, I actually used, and it was right up to the mid 1950s, and um, before I come into the trade, but people, Jody and I was uh, training me, talked about when they were younger how they used to coat their own glass negatives because film was out then, but not in the size that we needed. So they actually coated their own film with glass. I put a light sensitive coating on it. They go in and they, that, that's what they'd expose on and develop them up. Uh, yeah, they'd coat, the, the camera operators, that was their trade, and they had to mix up the silver nitrate and coat the glass film. This is just another view of a gully camera. Now, about the time I come in the trade, they also had vertical cameras. Uh, which is the same sort of thing, only it's more compact because they had a mirror on the front of it. So you put your stuff on the copy board there, put a mirror in there, and we're in to the back of the camera, which was built into the dark room. So it was quite compact, you know, to stick out there and had a room to go into. That was a vertical camera. But then it came into the digital age. Um, I actually, uh, yeah. Film etching, dyeing, processing on film to offset printing plates. This is sort of all happening together with the uh, digital printing age. The, although offset printing had been around for years, in newspapers it was fairly late coming on the scene. Um, uh, Adobe Photoshop, I think, came out about 1990, we started using it. Uh, I started using it about 1992, and they had that hooked up to scanners. Um, there, there's a little bit of information there. Scanners, you know, give the best quality. In fact, that's a photo I found of one that I actually learnt on, I think, in the 1970s. Uh, it wasn't computer driven like they are now. There was computers hooked up to it, but it was all sort of math. You take density readings, you type in what size percent dots you want in certain areas and control it like that. It was quite huge, quite a big machine from here to the wall, this high. 
And uh, they're now sort of bench top things now, or actually flatbed scanners are only getting up to the same resolution and quality. Um, just going back here, high end drum shatters, I think Photoshop was actually released, released by Adobe about 1990. Uh, and it was, uh, that's when um, Photoshop first came out. It was intended from the start as a tool for manipulating images that were digitised by a scanner. And it was a rare and expensive bit of software and stuff to have in the days. You know, tone or colour correction uh, in the past days, uh, tone and colour correction I used to use by. You could actually put a screen image on the film and you could actually do colour correction on it by etching it. And uh, you used to use cyanide, so you didn't lick your brush. <laughs> Um, going back to um, something I missed uh, saying here on my slides, you're doing uh, half tones. Where's that half tones there? Here. Uh, how you could control your images when you're etching into a half tone and a, and a printed image, you can probably see by this here. When you start etching it, overall, before you start it, the whole screen image is fairly dark. It was made deliberately so, so the whites were grey. So what you'd do is, I would use black pitch and once it was etched, there was depth in it, like the horse, I painted around that horse with that pitch, put the, put, then put it into an acid bath, the acid bath etched into the other, and as, it eat, as the acid ate into a screen image, it, it reduces the size of the dot, or it opens up the dot in there. So you could actually get tonal control. You could improve an image. You could make something stand out. So that horse there, I made that stand out a bit. And you see the background's a bit lighter in relation to it. When you look at it, oh, that was a nice photograph. But in actual fact, originally, that some of those dark shadows in the background there were as dark as the horse. But I made them, grade them out a bit by staging. I just painted them out the pitch and took the rest lighter. So you stage it. So as you go through it, you just the highlights, you flick them out and um, you can improve on the job. Now, that's what I did 40 years ago, and that's why university students couldn't understand what I knew what to do in Photoshop today, <laughs> is create contrast to make images look good. When images print, there's a little tip for you. These tones here are all separated by the same percent, but don't these here look much closer together? <laughs> when you print, that actually becomes worse. That one will become the same as that one, and that's because of the reflection qualities of that little dot in the down here. And, and ink, when it prints, it tends to fill in more on these than the other end. So my trade was to compensate for tonal loss or degradation by emphasising more contrast, lightening tones to allow for dot gain when it prints. Now, depending on the paper, how it's printing, you do it differently. You even have to sharpen images up to sort of brighten them up a bit because the edges become furry. Because it's broken into a screen, they become soft. All of you with digital cameras now, if you take a digital photograph, you reduce it down in size, sometimes it'll print soft and a bit muddy because it's down sampled, it's thrown away data, and all those little pixels soften the edge of the image. And uh, you should always resharpen them and sometimes rejig your tones a little bit. Um, any questions on that? Yeah, that's that, sorry. That that um, copper was, would it be sulfuric acid? Did you use no nitric. Nitric, but on the copper you said the copper. No, uh, uh, not chromic acid. It's that's uh, <laughs> gone out of your head. That's all right. I think I wrote it down. That's a brown. Uh, I've actually got some at home, actually. Yes. That's, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, a, a brown acid, you know, I'm thinking chromic oxide. Maybe it's already a green acid. Is it? Okay. Now, the image missing here.
other things to talk about ethics of the digital age. I'm seeing it happen so much now. <laughs> in that uh, the power of the, the program, um, I had a little picture there, I don't know what's happened to it. It was there when I copied it across. But it was actually a, a cartoon of uh, a, a UFO, it was a, a far side cartoon. And here's this uh, van now parked out to this bloke in a shop picking up his prints. And um, the fellow that the, was uh, just giving him the prints and taking his money he said, Oh, he said, We've got some new photo imaging software. I took the liberty of just taking out some dark stuff <coughs> around the clouds. I noticed on, the, on your background, and the bloke's <laughs> looking horrified at the time because the band parked in here was a UFO. <laughs> <laughs> I just brought the digital images in to get printed. <laughs> but, uh, yes. Uh, Photoshop actually, uh, I can't read it, it goes back quite a while. Um, when I come in, I think it was 1990, come in. I think I come in about um, version, uh, about this way, version 2, I think, I started. And uh, basically gone with it since then. It is extremely powerful. If I've got time, I'll do a quick demonstration. Okay? I'll just uh, end this now. This is not the latest Photoshop, incidentally. I can't afford now to retire keep up with them. I do do it at WEA, but this is CS4, which is essentially the same. I found I did this one quite a few years ago. Now, any of you, have any of you got Photoshop or use Elements? If you were here? I don't know how many of you in the uh, newspaper game. Oh. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. I'll mirror the um, my display set up for the uh, uh, That's it. Very good. Right. Mm. Sounds a bit silly there. I'm talking about you. What's he on about? <laughs> now. Any of you with uh, a, lot of, a lot of the other programs might have it, it might be in an obscure place. But every photo that um, is taken on a digital camera has uh, metadata with it. You've probably heard of the term. Photoshop and uh, Photoshop Elements, and I think some other programs, you can access this data. And you can actually add your own information. Many of you, like photographs, you used to write on the back who was in the photo, you know, this was Aunt Molly taken uh, such and such, you know. Um, what do you do now? They give creative file names. But, um, I thought, well, how many creative file names can you do when you've got a few hundred photos on your system yeah. this <laughs> month, next year, and over the next 10 years? You, you know. Photoshop has what, what you call, uh, and I think this is available to you, um, you can have, have metadata that comes in with it. There's video data, audio data, there's a whole lot of things you can put tags and files, camera data. There isn't any on that because that's what it's like. If you cut and paste, you lose it. But in the description in here, the, the photographer took that as Liam Driver, and this was uh, Civic Park, Tuesday the 30th of July 2002. And this was for an article about the big trees being taken down. <laughs> And the editor came up to me and said, I want you to take the fig trees out of park so we can have a picture of what it'll look like without the fig trees. <coughs> I thought, what a coincidence. I've still got this thing here with all the debate going on today. No one really knows what it looked like. Well, I can, guess I can show you with the power of Photoshop. Oh, no. um, that's what it probably looks like. Oh, that was <laughs> awful. Oh, dear. And they want to get rid of it. <laughs> that's funny, I just read something. Yeah, now... What I did was, how, how, how we did this, um, this is all done by layering. One of the most, most powerful things with Photoshop, you can actually put an image on each layer. It's like a stage setting, one thing in front of the other. And you can see all the layers down the side here. Okay. And what they did was, they took a photo of the park, 
Then they went behind the trees in Lane Street and took photo of each of the buildings. Now, I did have some distortion problems and everything else, but I had parts of the complete buildings there, so what I did was I <coughs> sized them according to what I could see through the trees, like the doorway there, a bit of the tabernacle there. It wasn't much for the art gallery, but it was sort of a bit hit and miss and guess, but anyway. If you look at that little point there, that's how I managed to size the uh, library and uh, when I took out the trees. Um, of course, when I took out the trees, I didn't have a sky, did I? So I had to create my own sky and put in there. So you can sort of, as I take away the, lay the layers, you can sort of see, <coughs> give away how I did it and build it up. And there's the sky, which was done separately. I found a nice sky somewhere and put that in there. So, that's how we did it. This is the digital equivalent of your horse. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's simply by layering images. <coughs> uh, many other things you can, you can do with it. This is very quick. Here's another one here I've done. This was an exercise for training people. Um, I, again, I uh, had a sky and what I did was I took the top, top half of the image and removed the sky that was there and put that in over the top so it had a nice presentation. <laughs> um, you could actually do architects. How are we going for time? Yeah. Just wind me up. I'm sort, of copying, I'm sort of indulging now. Um, we'll take a tree. This is how architects can use this program. This is something for everyone. Um, I've actually set this up a little bit myself. Um, I've made a mask for it, so if I can uh, use that mask to make a selection of that tree, I'm going to put that tree, and I want to put, it's a new house, and I don't know what it looks like. I want to make it a little bit more presentable, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put some trees in it. Dodgy real estate agents. Okay. <coughs> put it there. Yeah, I might have a few trees along the path. So um, I'll just sort of duplicate it a bit. Uh, <laughs> going along there. Now, the, the perspective's wrong. Um, there's things I can do to get around that problem. Uh, So on, you know, I can uh, I can actually yeah. like, hand the spray shadows in if you wanted to. Normally I copy an image of the tree, but you can actually just put it in the shadows, just throw it in the shadows around. And so on and so forth. You get to cool. That's little things like that. Um, another tool I got, years ago I sort of said I'd, uh, if you had to engrave defects out or something was in a photo you didn't want, with Photoshop now it's got that power. <laughs> Getting that clever, you can actually uh, take things out that um, with a spot healing. So how it works, it actually can just paint over an image like that there you don't want. Whereas when I started out, I'd use probably the mini liner. 
to um, hand engrave dots. You'd go through and you'd actually hand engrave those dots on the zinc plate to take out the defect. But Photoshop there is <laughs> There's a cladding tool, a spot healing tool, there's a few of them there. Um, Actually, if any of you know the difference between vector drawing and normal bitmap images, bitmap images are like your photographs that are shades, pixels, images. But vector drawn images are images that are drawn on a computer and they're actually drawn using in Adobe Illustrator or something like that. And Photoshop actually is merging vector drawing with. Uh, images and it can actually vector drawing you can actually scale an image you can have a small image do it in an art and you can actually keep blowing it up and it doesn't pixelize because the computer actually redraws it according to it. so it's a mathematical equation sometimes it's getting very clever it has got the same photographic quality and you can't do the same effects as a bitmap image but it has its use and what they're doing in photoshop they actually can do I've got a combination of them, and I can actually draw things or create things in Photoshop. I'm drawing a line here, which I can use later to draw it to, to assist me in drawing an image. Okay. Now there's there's a line. I can do a whole variety of things to that line to the edit it and correct it. Now, why would you do this? You might ask. Well, in Photoshop, I can run text along that path. I can actually draw along that path. I've got a shaky hand, and uh, I might uh, make this into a chord, and I'll um, put that on its own layer. So I'm on the top layer. I'm going to have a chord there. What I'll do is I'll um, get my uh, brush tool and that looks like good size. I'll make it a thicker cord. Uh, okay, that's how, That's the size of my cord thickness. I might have it green. And what I'm going to do is, I'll just uh, set this up to um, stroke it. So I'll go up here and uh, tell it to, oops. There's a path I've made. I'll go up and I want to stroke that path. Stroke the path and I'll use the brush. Go OK. Oh, it's not quite the opacity I want, so I'll just go and do that again. I might just put this little thing down here. There it is there. So there's the path now. It's, it looks a bit flat. I might I might put a highlight along that line. So what I'll do is I'll just go to my uh, my little tools here. Dodge tool, which is like a photographic term, dodging and burning. I'm 
took them a few years, they'd sort of expose something to make it lighter or darker. Well, what I'll do is I'm going to use a smaller brush here. And, along that now with the, that particular tool. Very quickly. Okay, now I'll sort of give it a bit of shape. Um, let's go back to my layers again. Slow here, boys. How are we going for time? What I'm going to do, I'm going to make a blinking globe. So this, people in web design use this, uh, web building. And uh, I want to make a blinking light. Once I do this, this will happen quite quickly. Um, I want to make that light. So I'll just, uh, that selection I've got running around, I'll just uh, move that. A Photoshop's got this little thing on here, you can actually make animated GIFs. You can actually create your own little movies in Photoshop simply by having using layers. So what you do is you create another, duplicate that one there, then I say light off. I duplicate it again and light on. I give each one a time. Second each. Second each. And five. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
very interesting. This has got me now interested in learning Photoshop. It is really uh, a powerful program, a very powerful program. Um, you know, simple things like... Uh, so how long ago did you work? Like, did you recently retire, but you've kept doing it through all those generations of Yeah, yeah, Photoshop. Well, the last three years I've been retired, but I'm actually still doing it WEA, I trained Photoshop. That's cool. So, uh, yeah. But, um, Pass these around, you can sort of see the um, as we're packing up. Maybe just improves. Colour set of colour proofs, how colour printing works. Thank you.